Good afternoon and, and welcome. I'm Neil Nickel, President and Chief Executive Officer of the YMCA of the USA. The National Resource Office for our 2,600 YMCAs across the country. And welcome to our esteemed guests, Mrs. Obama, Dr. Benjamin, Secretary Sibelius, Dr. Palfrey. We're glad you're here. Welcome to our YMCA. I'd also like to thank the staff here at the Alexandria YMCA, especially the branch executive director, Bob Hammond, and the leaders of the YMCA of Metropolitan Washington, Angie Reese Hawkins, who is the president and chief executive officer, Stan Law, who is the executive vice president of organizational advancement, Pam Curran, the chief operations officer, and Janice Williams, senior vice president for program development. The YMCA is so very honored to be a partner in this important effort and proud to be the host today. YMCAs provide safe, affordable spaces and programs to help both kids and adults learn, grow, and thrive. In fact, for nearly 160 years, YMCAs have offered programs to strengthen the physical, emotional, and spiritual health of millions of individuals from all backgrounds and all types of communities. Over the past several years, we've increased our efforts to help stem the tide of rising obesity and chronic disease rates. There's an excellent example of this right here in our YMCA of Metropolitan Washington. Just five years ago, the Metropolitan YMCA launched the PhD program. Now, PhD stands for Physical, Healthy, and Driven, and is designed for children ages 5 to 14. This nationally recognized youth wellness program uses a unique combination of assessment tools, fun games, exercises, nutrition education, and family involvement to help get children active and be well. There's no better way to get children moving than by literally parking a playground right in their front yard. The PhD on the Move van, the region's first traveling playground, allows the YMCA to bring opportunities for healthy play, healthy eating, wellness, education, right to the doorsteps of local children. The interactive zone next door, which a couple of us had a chance to play with before we all got here, uh, is, is our latest tool to combat childhood obesity through fun and exciting activities, this time using technology. To date, 24,600 children have taken part in the PhD as part of after school, summer day camp, in school programs, specialized wellness events, and mobile health and well being programs operated by the YMCA of Metropolitan Washington, D.C. Nationally, our YMCA serve over 9 million kids each year through programs like childcare, after school, camps, youth and government, youth sports, aquatics, and much, much more. And we are very serious about our responsibility to help each and every one of these children and youth develop healthy behaviors, get a good education, and develop important values and life skills that will carry them into adulthood. We believe that our responsibility to support individuals of all ages in adopting and maintaining healthy lifestyles reaches beyond the walls of the YMCA. It extends to the entire community. That's why we are also committed to working with community leaders to influence policy and systems changes to increase physical activity and improve access to healthy foods. Our Healthier Communities initiatives, supported by Dr. Frieden and the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Focus on collaborative engagement with community leaders, how environments influence health and well-being, and the role public policy plays in sustaining change. The nearly 140 communities now participating in these initiatives have had success in improving community walkability and pedestrian safety by changing zoning laws that ensure the inclusion of sidewalks in new developments, increasing access to fresh fruits and vegetables, by bringing farmers markets to communities where healthy foods were not available, and influencing policy to institute physical education requirements back into our schools and our after school programs. We've added new communities for each of the last six years and will continue to expand these initiatives to bring this work to as many communities as possible across the country. We need to make the healthy choice the easy choice by ensuring that our communities have adequate opportunities for children, families, and adults to engage in healthy behaviors in all of the places where they live, work, learn, and play. To each of you, 
We look forward to addressing this issue of childhood obesity, and please know that you can count on the YMCA to be part of the solution. Now I'd like to introduce our nation's Surgeon General, Dr. Regina Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin has been on the job for almost three months now. <laughs> We have high expectations. We seem to have high expectations in this country for everybody who's only been on the job a little while. As America's, as America's doctors, <laughs> as America's doctor, she provides the public with the best scientific information available on how to improve their health in the, edu health in the education of our children. Dr. Benjamin, I'd just like to say, and to the rest of our guests, you are, of course, welcome to visit any of our YMCAs anytime. And I can assure you, if you do that, you will probably have a world-class collection of t-shirts and sweatshirts. <laughs> Dr. Benjamin. Thank you, Neil, especially for your 40 years of leadership and service and the YMCA for all that you do. It certainly played a major role in my little community in Alabama. It's an honor to be with you, and as well as all of my people here on the, on the it's not a podium, but yeah, on the floor <laughs> um, with you. Um, Dr. Palfrey from the Academy of Pediatrics, Secretary Sebelius, and our First Lady, Michelle Obama. Also, we have Virginia's First Lady, Maureen McDonald, and Congressman Moran, and Mayor Yule. Thank you all for your support of this very important public health issue and for being here today for the release of my Surgeon General's vision for a healthy nation and fit nation. In 2001, former Surgeon General David Satcher, in his call to action to prevent and decrease overweight and obesity, warned us about the negative effects that weight and weight gain and unhealthy lifestyles were having on Americans health and well-being. To reverse these trends, he outlined a national public health response. And now we are following up with the Surgeon General's vision for a healthy and fit nation. This paper lays out our ways to co concretely respond to the public's health issues that were raised nine years ago. Although we've made some strides since 2001, the number of Americans like me who are struggling with their weight and health conditions related to their weight remain much too high. Among adults, obesity rates doubled between 1980 and 2004. Most of you know the often repeated statistic in America today that more than two-thirds of adults and one in three children are overweight or obese. We see the sobering impact that these numbers in the high rates of chronic diseases such as diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illnesses that is starting to affect our children more and more. For years, we've encouraged Americans to eat more, eat more nutritiously, exercise regularly, and maintain healthy lifestyles. But for these things to happen, Americans need to live and to work in environments that support their efforts. There's a growing consensus that we as a nation need to create communities and environments where as you heard, the healthy choices are the easy choices. My vision for a healthy and fit nation is an attempt to change the national conversation from a negative one about obesity and illness to a positive conversation about being healthy and being fit. We need to stop bombarding Americans with what they can't have, what they can't eat, what's terrible things gonna happen to them if they don't get on some dreaded exercise equipment. <laughs> we need to start talking about what they can do to become healthy and fit, to go dancing because you enjoy it, to choose a healthier meal because you've demanded that the food companies make the healthy meal the best tasting meal. We need to make exercise activities fun, something people will enjoy, something they want to be doing, such as playing sports, swimming, or just taking a walk. To do this, we need to reach out to parents and to teachers, as well as mobilize um, action as, and assistance across all of gov federal government. In partnership with governors and mayors, medical community, leading foundations, and the sports and business communities, we need their help to support common sense, innovative tools and solutions. 
For example, healthy foods should be affordable and accessible to all Americans in our diverse communities. Children should spend less time in front of the TV. Children should also be having fun and playing in safe neighborhoods that provide parks, recreational facilities, community centers, and walking and bike paths. Schools need to serve healthy food and set higher nutrition standards. Schools should also require daily physical ed education classes and recess periods. Hospitals, work sites, and all communities should make it easier for mothers to initiate and sustain breastfeeding. Employers should implement wellness programs that promote healthy eating in cafeterias, encourage physical activity through group classes, and create incentives for employers, employees to participate. I hope that communities across the nation will use this vision for a healthy and fit nation as a blueprint for action, to work more effectively, to share resources, to develop partnerships, and to use innovative solutions for change. As Surgeon General, I want Americans to live long and healthy lives. To become, to become a healthy and fit nation, we must remember that Americans are more likely to change their behavior if they have a meaningful reward, something more than just reaching a certain weight or a certain dress size. The real reward has to be something that people can feel, that people can enjoy, that they can celebrate. The reward is invigorating, energizing, joyous health. This health is at a level of health that allows people to embrace each day and live their lives to the fullest without disease, disability, or loss of productivity. Finally, I want to say that we st today we stand at a crossroads. The old normal was to stress the importance of attaining a recommended number for weight and BMI. And although these numbers are very important measures of disease and disability, the total picture is much, much bigger. It involves the creation of a new normal with an emphasis on achieving an optimal level of health and well-being. People want to live long and to live well, and they're making their voices heard across this nation. Today's ob obesity epidemic calls for committed, compassionate citizens to mobilize and demand the health and well-being they so richly deserve. I've heard their call. We all here have heard their call. And I'm honored to do everything in my power to help Americans live long, to live well, to be healthy, and to be a fit nation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Benjamin, for those wonderful words and, and encouragement toward health. I'm uh, Dr. Judith Palfrey. I'm the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The Surgeon General's report challenges us as a nation to turn the tide on obesity. As a practicing pediatrician for over 30 years, I can tell you firsthand that we have experienced an alarming increase in the number of children and adolescents who are overweight and obese. Today, most physicians are dealing with overweight and obesity in 20 to 30 percent of the children we see. Now, contrary to the vision that uh, Dr. Benjamin just said, our obese children do not have a healthy childhood. Overweight toddlers have trouble toddling. They do not have the strength and coordination to carry out that extra weight. Overweight and obese children have higher rates of asthma. When we take x-rays of their chests, their families are astounded to see that little tiny rib cage surrounded by layers of fat. Their chest can be two to three times normal, just carrying that weight. No wonder they struggle to run and jump, and they succumb easily to asthma and other respiratory diseases. School-age youngsters who are overweight and obese have a very high risk of bone and joint problems, the most serious of which can be a major medical emergency. Obese teenagers come in with problems ranging from diabetes to hypertension to sleep apnea. And for all these children, social and emotional concerns are very common. In fact, many children and adolescents who are overweight or obese actually suffer from clinical depression. Now, it does not have to be this way. 
We have proven early interventions that can keep children healthy in the vision that Dr. Benjamin has just shown us. And the two keys to that are healthy nutrition and regular physical activity. Good nutrition in childhood sets the stage for lifelong healthy eating and celebrating eating. It's not bad to eat, just gotta eat healthy. <laughs> Pediatricians encourage mothers to breastfeed. We encourage childcare providers and schools to serve healthy foods and families to have colorful, well-balanced meals together. In addition to counseling families every day, pediatricians are now involved in a wide range of programs, partnering programs, to promote health, healthy eating. We're developing guides with nutritionists. We're creating cookbooks to hand out to parents and grandparents. Now, along with nutrition, physical activity is fundamental to good health. Play, after all, is the work of children. It not only helps them grow and build strong bodies, but for our educators and everyone else, it actually improves their concentration and their ability to learn. Working with schools wise like this one, boys and girls clubs, the American Academy of Pediatricians urges that every child has the opportunity to be active at least 60 minutes every day. Let me say that again. Active at least 60 minutes every day. Our young pediatricians in training at the University of Mexico have developed a mom and me exercise group with their families and they literally get down on the floor and jump around like croaking frogs with the kids. <laughs> Did I mention that prevention can be fun? Finally, there's a strong relationship between screen time, that's television, computers, and video, and the development of overweight and obesity. Limiting that screen time to two hours a day can help our children get <coughs> moving. We're working hard to prevent obesity before it ever starts. We need to meet people where they are, be sensitive to the different needs of various populations. No single solution is going to work for everyone. As the Surgeon General has said, it's a challenge, but we know we can surmount it together. Our nation must commit itself to a long-term campaign to transform our children's health. The American Academy of Pediatrics is proud, proud to stand today with the administration in working to ensure a healthy future for all our nation's children. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Secretary of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius. Secretary Sebelius has been a leader on health care. She's helped with families and children for over 20 years. As governor of Kansas, she was recognized for her work to improve access to health care. And since taking office in April 2009, she's been a leader in some of the top issues for children, including the reform of our nation's health and response to H1N1. Doctor, uh, we are very, very proud to be working with you. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sibelius. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm thank you, Dr. Palfrey, for uh, not only that nice introduction, but thanks for being here, and thanks for the work of the Academy of Pediatrics on a host of issues affecting our nation's children, and we have an illustrious group here um, on the floor, and uh, certainly are pleased to be joined by our partners. Um, you know, Congressman Moran has a long history on wellness and obesity issues that he's worked on in Congress, and we look forward to working with you as this effort moves forward. Um, Mayor Yule, it's nice to be back in your city. We've done a lot of innovative clinics and other activities, and I can't imagine any child not wanting to go into the room next door and hang out. I mean, it's <laughs> fabulous. So to the Y here and to the National Ys, uh, congratulations. It's a, uh, I want to go hang out. Um, and we're thrilled to have the First Lady of Virginia here. Um, I have to tell you, Mrs. McDonald, that my husband still 
um, regrets us moving out of assisted living. And, uh, you know, we had the opportunity to live in a governor's residence for seven years. And he was happy to have me take this job, but he didn't know why he couldn't stay where he was. So we're still trying to sort that out a little bit. Um, and I'm very pleased to uh, be joining in this effort with uh, my friend and our wonderful First Lady, Michelle Obama. Um, you know, we got some pretty good exercise last night, all that standing up and clapping and sitting down and standing up. Uh, but it's, it's thrilling to have her take on the role as the leading advocate in this country for healthy living. Um, Dr. Benjamin cares a lot about the lives and health of Americans. She used to focus that attention in her clinic in Alabama, and now we have the great opportunity to have her become America's doctor and focus that attention around the country. Um, and, you know, as she said, we used to have a whole set of rules which were just given out to people. Eat five fruits and vegetables a day, you know, get your kids out from behind the computer, go to the gym. Uh, but often that fell on deaf ears. And while those are very important things to do, if we're really serious about turning the corner on this issue, we need everyone to be involved. We need to make this a national crisis and a national issue because it has a huge national impact. The president last night pointed out so eloquently that the Healthcare costs for average families are continuing to skyrocket, making it very hard for families to pay their bills, and the ability of small businesses to keep affordable health care is getting more and more difficult, and that often impacts their ability to keep good employees and expand their businesses. The unhealthier we are as a nation, uh, the more our health care costs will continue to rise, and the less competitive we will be globally in the world. So we have a not only moral obligation, but I would say an economic imperative to begin to make a change. Uh, and let me just give you a couple of pretty alarming statistics. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we already spend one out of every ten healthcare dollars on obesity and its complications. Uh, overall, we spend almost twice the amount today that we spent on obesity in 1998. That's how bad these trends have gotten. Nearly $150 billion a year. And to put that in perspective, that's more than is spent on all, treating all the cancers in America, year in and year out, um, almost half again as much. A lot of the money that we're talking about goes to treating the chronic diseases which have obesity as an underlying cause. And we know those include heart disease and stroke and type 2 diabetes and certain kinds of cancers which are directly related to obesity. Medical care for diabetes and its complications alone costs more than $116 billion a year. Health care costs related to heart disease cost the country almost $93 billion a year and stroke another $48 billion, all of which are directly tied to obesity. And that's just what we're spending today. Right now, we have more children who are overweight and obese than we've ever had before in this nation, four times higher than it was 40 years ago. So many children now have type 2 diabetes that we no longer refer to it as adult onset diabetes. It's just referred to as type 2, uh, which is a relatively recent and alarming change. In fact, we have the first generation of American <coughs> children where if we don't change the trajectory, they will have a shorter lifespan than their parents uh, here in the United States of America. The fact that some of these consequences don't show up for 10 or 15 or 20 years uh, should not make this any less of a crisis, although Dr. Palfrey just did a great job outlining what really happens in the unseen impacts of childhood obesity. Um, the administration has already supported some major changes in policy to help reverse the growing trends of obesity. One of the most historic steps is the Recovery Act that the President signed almost a year ago, which is going to have a first time ever $650 million investment in prevention and wellness aimed at obesity and smoking cessation. Community projects across this country will be experimenting with what really it takes to make some changes. And the Surgeon General has already recognized that there are a range of factors influencing obesity. 
what we've already done with those grants is, is begin to allocate them to states, but also to ask communities to come up with creative strategies. And some of the ideas are really encouraging. In fact, we're way oversubscribed, but we'll have 30 of the best projects underway later this spring. Um, we're also fighting another factor, which is advertising. One of the reasons that it's good for your child to move away from the television is not just that it gets him or her up and around, it's that they stop being bombarded with the ads that are particularly aimed at children on kids TV. Um, we know that uh, a recent study indicated that if you're watching a child's program on TV, every eight minutes you will have a junk food ad. Um, it's not surprising that children can identify most of the brands of the unhealthy foods because companies are spending a billion and a half dollars a year marketing those products to our children. And now those ads have spread to video games and websites. So not only on television, but they're coming through in a variety of medium. And that's another initiative that we've got to take very seriously. So if a child gets diabetes because he turns 18, uh, partly because when he was younger he only ate foods he saw every day on TV and the internet. It's not just his fault, it's our fault. We have to change that dynamic. So if we can change the way our children eat and help them be healthier, we also bring down health care costs. Last night in his State of the Union address, President Obama recognized the urgency of this issue and nominated our next speaker to lead a national movement to address it. Now the First Lady has not only been uh, on the national stage a relatively short period of time, but she's instantly become the most visible and respected advocate for healthier lifestyles in America. She's everyone's favorite vegetable gardener. <laughs> she uh, had a healthy kids fair last summer on the White House lawn. Uh, she has uh, been talking to America about choices they can make. She's launching a national campaign to reverse the epidemic of childhood obesity. And we look forward to being a good partner in that effort. So it's my great pleasure to ask you to give a great warm welcome to our First Lady, Michelle Obama. As you know from that last night, I get embarrassed when people stand up and clap for me. I, I don't really know what to do. Do I, do I wave? Do I? So it's like, please, just, just sit down, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here on the floor. Uh, it's a great floor. It's a, kind of a warm floor, but it's a good floor. Um, let me begin by thanking uh, uh, the new First Lady uh, in the room, uh, Maureen McDonald. Uh, we are going to have a great time working together. She is already very engaged and supportive of, of these initiatives. And since she's so close, uh, I am counting on uh, her to work alongside uh, on some of these issues. We're going to see you in a month uh, at the governor's gala, whatever they call it. Uh, so be ready to dance <laughs> and welcome aboard. A little practice. Uh, absolutely. Um, Congressman Moran, uh, again, I want to thank you for all your work in this area. Um, I look forward to working with you. Our staffs are already talking about uh, some things that you've been working on for a very long time, so we're grateful for your leadership and concern and focus. Uh, Mayor Yule, uh, again, you have been uh, a host to, to me in your great city, and you've done wonderful work in this area. Uh, had a terrific time addressing the National Conference of Mayors and I got a very good response from your colleagues. Uh, I know that the mayors in this country stand ready to work on this issue. They are seeing the effects of what uh, everyone on this floor has talked about in terms of childhood obesity and, and they're ready to uh, make some changes. Um, also Dr. Uh, Paul Free, uh, it is an honor for us to have you with us. Um, as I've shared before, it was through our relationship with our pediatrician that 
we even began as a family to start thinking about these issues. And it's, it's our pediatricians and our medical community that are going to work side by side with families throughout the country. Uh, so we're grateful for your support. I know that this is not a new issue for you. Uh, and I hope that our attention to it makes your job a little bit easier. Um, uh, I also want to um, thank all the folks at the Y um, for all you're doing, Neil Nickel, uh, for your work as the national leader. But I know you know as a national leader, the real work happens on the ground at these uh, fine facilities all throughout the country. Uh, the Y has been a leader. Uh, in ensuring that families and communities all over this country have access to places to play. Uh, your uh, mobile physical unit, your PhD unit that came to the South Lawn helped me debut my hula hooping skills. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the wise are showing that they are um, thinking uh, towards the next stage. You know, the room that we were in is the next generation of what WISE can be. The mobile unit is something that I didn't grow up with, but you're keeping, uh, uh, you're keeping up with the changes in cultures and communities in a way that is going to make a huge impact to, to the, the work that we have to do in, in our nation. And finally, I want to thank my, my buddy in crime, Secretary Sebelius, for her tremendous leadership and her tremendous friendship. Uh, we're glad that you moved out of assistant living. <laughs> I know it's hard. I know, I know, I'll work on him. <laughs> but you can come over for dinner or something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> from your work uh, with the CDC to the FDA, the Department of Health and Human Services is clearly at the forefront of ad addressing some of our greatest health issues, and it's going to take their continued commitment uh, these grants that are coming out, we've been working uh, with your department uh, and getting them done. Your staff has been tremendous and moving very quickly on getting that money out, and I'm anxious to see uh, what all that hard work is, uh, leads to. So we are grateful not just to you, but all of the thousands of people in your agency who make, uh, make us all look very good. And finally, I want to commend our new Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Benjamin, who I finally got to meet. <laughs> uh, three months on the job and we're already making you crazy, right? <laughs> but you're doing a terrific job just jumping right in. The report is not only timely, but um, it, it's right on point. Uh, and your perspective, your new way of looking at this issue is, is refreshing. And again, it's right on point. Uh, it's presenting both the dangers of inaction and a vision for health for, uh, for this country. Uh, it's an incredible step uh, in, in a long uh, journey that we'll have to take. So we want to thank you for your important work. So as we've seen, the surge in obesity in this country is nothing short of a public health crisis. Um, and it's threatening our children. It's threatening our families. And more importantly, it, it's threatening the future of this nation. Higher rates of obesity are directly linked, as you've heard, to higher rates of chronic illnesses like heart disease and cancer and diabetes. Uh, and even though type 2 diabetes is rare among young people, more than three quarters of those who have it are obese. Uh, in fact, the health consequences are so severe that, as the Secretary said, uh, medical experts have warned that our children are on track to be less healthy than we are. Uh, and there's never been uh, a generation of young people who are on track to be healthier than their parents or less healthy than their parents. And truly, if we're really honest with ourselves, it's not hard to understand how this happens. Uh, I tried to track this through my own life. Uh, in some cases, it's access. Uh, parents have told me, I've seen it myself, that they would love nothing more than to feed their kids more healthy foods. Uh, but if you don't live anywhere near a place that sells fresh produce, it's very hard to accomplish that goal. Uh, in other cases, the issue is just convenience. Um, you know, at the end of a long day, uh, and more and more families are experiencing these long days with two parents working and busy schedules. Um, you just get home and you're tired and you pick up the phone and you order a pizza 
uh, or you go to that drive-through, it's just easier. Uh, our modern day life makes it very difficult for us to sit down and prepare that meal. And a lot of times it's affordability. Uh, in these tough economic times, buying healthy foods unfortunately feels like a luxury uh, for too many families. Uh, they just can't afford it. Uh, we've seen stories, we've heard stories of people who know that buying that large gallon of juice is cheaper than buying a gallon of milk. Um, they can't afford to make different choices. Uh, and then at schools and in our communities, uh, oftentimes it's budget cuts uh, that make it more difficult. Recess and PE are gone for many kids uh, in, in communities all across this, this country. Parks and playgrounds and after school sports are few and far between in, in too many neighborhoods. Uh, and for most people, the cause is really a combination of all of these things. It's no one particular thing. It's everything uh, cobbled together. And let's face it, there are really just too many pressures on parents today. Uh, and I s understand those pressures. I talk about this all the time. Um, it's easy to live healthy when you live in the White House and you have staff and people who are cooking for you and making sure that it's balanced and colorful because I had a hard time doing it before I lived in the White House, and that wasn't so long ago. Uh, Barack and I were like any working couple. Uh, I was a working mom with a husband that was busy, busy so many times I was the one uh, balancing that load uh, and wrestling with many of those challenges, and there were plenty of times I'd tell you that you come home tired, you don't want to hear the kids fuss, and popping something in the microwave or picking up a burger was just heaven. Uh, it was a godsend, uh, but we were fortunate enough to have uh, a pediatrician, as I've mentioned, uh, that kind of waved the red flag for, for me as a mother uh, and basically cautioned me that I had to take a look at my own children's BMI. Now, we went to our pediatrician all the time. I thought my kids were perfect. They are and always will be. Uh, <laughs> But he warned that he was concerned that something was getting off balance because fortunately he was a pediatrician that worked predominantly in an African American urban community and he knew these trends existed. Uh, and he was watching very closely in his client population, his patient population. Uh, so again, in my eyes, my children were perfect. Uh, I didn't see the changes. Uh, and that's also part of the problem. Uh, or part of the challenge. Uh, it's often hard to see changes in your own kids uh, when you're living with them day in and day out. Uh, as parents, we all know and will readily acknowledge broadly that kids in general, uh, we will say, we know they don't eat right, right? Uh, and we know they don't get as much exercise as they should, generally. But we often simply don't realize that those kids are our kids. Um, and our kids could be in danger of becoming obese. We always think that only happens to someone else's kid, and I was in that position. Uh, we all want desperately to make the best choices for our kids, uh, but in this climate, it's hard to know uh, what's the right thing to do anymore. Uh, so even though I wasn't exactly sure at that time what I was supposed to do with this information about my children's BMI, I knew that I had to do something, that I had to lead our family to a different way. Uh, but the beauty was that for me, over the course of a few months, uh, we started making really minor changes. And I share this story because the changes were so minor. Uh, we did things like, uh, you know, limit TV time. My kids were already fairly active, uh, but, you know, we cut TV time out during the week, and that helped increase activity because they were just running up and down the stairs annoying me more. Uh, we paid more attention to portion size. Uh, didn't make a big deal out of it, but just sort of said, listen to when you're hungry and when you're full, stop. Uh, we reduced our intake of sugary drinks and instead encouraged our kids to drink more water. I just put water bottles in the lunch uh, during the week where we had low-fat milk. Again, didn't make a big deal out of it, just made the change. Uh, we put more fruits and vegetables in our diets. Um, 
again, trying to make for a color colorful palette, uh, but you slip some grapes in uh, at breakfast time and throw in an apple at lunch and pester them about whether they actually ate the apple. Uh, and then you try to balance it out with something at dinner time. I mean, it was really very minor stuff. But these small changes resulted in some really significant improvements. And I didn't know it would. It was so significant that the next time we visited our pediatrician, he was amazed. Uh, he looked over the girls' charts and he said, what on earth are you doing? Uh, and I said, really, not much. Uh, not much. And that's the good news that we want to share with families, um, particularly for kids. Small changes can lead to big results. Um, they're not destined to this fate. Uh, and they're not really in control what goes into their mouths, usually. Uh, so we know what has led to the obesity e epidemic. You know, we, we, we know inside. I mean, we're still learning, but we kind of know. Uh, and we know what we need to do to solve it. Uh, we just have to make the commitment to do it. We really, each and every one of us needs to make that commitment. We need to provide parents with better nutritional information so that they can make better choices. Uh, we need to give our kids healthier options at school where many kids are getting most of their meals. Uh, we need to make sure they're spending less time in front of the TV and playing video games and more time exercising and having fun and doing the work of children, which is play. Uh, but we also know that the solution uh, can't come from government alone. Uh, that's something that we just have to remind ourselves, and for many, that's a great relief. Uh, everyone has to be willing to do their part to solve this problem, uh, and everyone has to work together to, to turn this pattern around. And that's exactly what we hope to do through an administration-wide initiative uh, on child obesity that I'm going to be launching in the next uh, couple of weeks, along with a number of important partners. We're going to be bringing the federal government together, uh, those resources in partnerships with business, nonprofit, and the foundation communities, all of whom are thrilled to be a part of this endeavor. It's just been refreshing to see so many people recognizing that this is the time to step up and make some changes. Uh, we're going to do a number of things, uh, again, some of them small things. Uh, we want to create what we're calling more healthy schools. Um, and these are schools that are uh, offering more nutritious meal options during the day. Uh, they're providing tr nutritional information to ch children as part of the curriculum, and they're ensuring that children are getting the increased exercise that we know that they need. Uh, but we also have to focus on increasing the amount of exercise outside of school. And no place like the Y knows that we need to make these changes. Um, we need to make healthy food options more affordable and accessible. And that's going to be probably one of the toughest things that we need to do. Uh, and we need to do this in all communities, urban, rural, everywhere. People have to have the information, they have to have access in order to make healthy choices. There is nothing more frustrating that will frustrate a parent more than to say that you've got to buy more fruits and, and vegetables, but to still see the cost out of kilter uh, and see those goals out of reach. Uh, so these are just some of the things that we hope to do through this initiative. But what we know is that we have to be ambitious, that the approach has to be ambitious. It can't just be lockstep. Uh, it's got to be something meaningful and powerful. Uh, and the other thing that I will say, uh, and say again and again and again, um, this won't be easy. So let's begin with that. <laughs> this will not be easy. Uh, and it won't happen overnight. Uh, and it won't happen simply because the First Lady has made it her priority. Uh, that in and of itself is not going to be enough. Uh, it's going to take all of us. Uh, Thank God it's not going to be solely up to me. <laughs> but it's going to take all of us, parents, schools, communities working together for a very long time, over a sustained period of time, over generations of children will need to keep doing this. Uh, but I have every confidence, uh, based on the level of energy that I've seen, based on the willingness of people to 
deal with this issue across party lines, uh, the willingness of bi the business community to be a part of the solution. Um, every sign that we've seen over the course of moving to this rollout has been nothing but positive. Uh, and of course, parents are ready and willing. We all want to make the best choices for our children. Uh, we just need to know how. Uh, and if we continue to do that, if we work with our physicians, if we work with our Surgeon General, if we've got uh, the government, the federal government working together, businesses ready to make the sacrifices, then we can tackle this problem. And we can do something really important for our kids. We can hand them the future that we know they're going to need to be successful. Uh, so I am excited. Uh, and I look forward to working with all of you over the next years to make this uh, not just a dream, but to make this movement a reality. So thank you all for the work that you've done so far. Um, and we have a lot more work to do. So thank you so much.